The unsurpassed, penetrating and perfect truth is seldom met with, even in a hundred thousand myriad kalpas. Now we can see and hear it, we can remember and accept it. I vow to make the Buddha's truth one with myself. Homage to the Buddha, homage to the Dharma, homage to the Sangha. The other day I was asked to give a talk to the monks about peace and I thought it might be helpful to talk about peace again today. It seems like a timely time. As we know, there have been terrible wildfires in the western states in the last few weeks. Thousands of homes have been burned, tens of thousands of people have been evacuated, something like half a million in Oregon alone. Some people have died, some have been injured. Some people we know have lost their homes and a lot of people we know have been evacuated. Not to mention all the animals that must have died or been hurt. It's just awful. So, we just had a transfer of merit ceremony and we offered lots of merit for all those who've been suffering. In the Lotus Sutra, there's a parable of the burning houses many of us are very familiar with and for those who aren't, um, the story is of a rich man who has a large rambling house and it's kind of falling into disrepair. Why he doesn't fix it, I don't know, but he doesn't. And he has a whole lot of children, lots of children, and they're all playing in the house. And the house catches fire because the wiring is very good and it's you know falling down. The kids are just sitting there playing. They're not noticing the fire that's burning. And he tries to get their attention to get them out. Leave, leave, the house is on fire. And they just look up and think, meep and go back to playing. And finally he has to entice them out with the promise of the three cards, which is the Dharma. Well, the burning houses are human life. Back in the time of the Buddha, same thing today. Our life is short, and we're prone to sickness, old age, and death. Never mind all the other things that happen, accident, so forth. And we don't want to look we don't want to see that impermanence. We just want to enjoy our life and pretend that fire isn't there. To pretend everything is fine. You know, everything is fine. Getting older, a little bit, but I'm all right. I'm still healthy. Or, you know, something is happening. Oh, it's, it's okay. Whether our house is literally burning down, or we're just sick, or we're getting old, or something unforeseen happens to us or to those we love. It's the same kind of thing. Impermanence is right there in our daily life. In big ways and in small ways, it permeates everything. We look in the mirror, we don't look quite like we looked five years ago, no matter what we think. Screw up our eyes, maybe I look okay, you know. <clears throat> How can we find peace of heart in the midst of all the suffering, both in our own lives and in our world? Not just the wildfires, but the pandemic that's still going on, still causing thousands of deaths, the violence and the hatred we see on the news, all the suffering we see, so many causes of it. How do we find peace of heart within all of that, without just thinking about just me, you know, I just want a peaceful heart and forget everybody else. It's not that. The Buddha has quite a bit to say about peace. And first, we have to start with ourselves. Peace in our relationships with other people. Living in harmony with others. Not giving in to anger and ill will and voicing angry words. Not arguing or insisting on our own view. Treating other people with respect and kindness, whether we know them well, whether they're our family or a complete stranger being gentle in our speech, not harsh or angry or divisive, saying things about other people, you know, not being greedy or stingy, mean when we could be giving something or sharing something, being straightforward and honest with people, not being insolent or offensive, the Buddha says, and 
All of these things and a whole lot more, the Buddha has plenty of them. They help to create peace with other people, with our family, our relationships, our casual encounters. And they help to create peace within ourselves. When we don't live in harmony with other people, we can't find peace within ourselves. When we give in to anger and voice it, we have an argument with someone or we're a little bit unkind or just mean, you know, mean-spirited thing to say or something. Or when we think only of ourselves at the expense of other people, grabbing something that really isn't for us, you know, or pushing someone else aside to get something. When we break the precept in other ways, we feel bad, especially if we've taken the precept and the longer we've gone training, the less it takes for us to feel bad about breaking them, about doing something that we know we shouldn't have done. And we're not at peace. When we feel bad, we're not at peace. So we try not to do these things, as the Buddha recommends. Peace within ourselves. The Buddha has plenty to say about this as well. Not giving in to anger, even if we don't express it outwardly, not nourishing anger, resentment, ill will, you know, resenting something that somebody did maybe years ago, not panting after things. I have to have this or I won't be happy. I have to have this. And then feeling upset when you don't get it, which often happens. Not feeding anxiety and worry and fear of the future. Not feeding sorrows and regrets about the past, things we've done, things that have happened to us and all that. Not being proud of ourselves. Practicing equanimity, even-mindedness as best we can, fair-mindedness. And again, there's a whole lot more, but I'll just start with that. Well, we talk about these things and we do try to practice them. And it all comes down to relinquishing our selfishness. Our selfishness. The less we're selfish, the more we will be at peace. It's selfishness that creates an uneasy heart. Even in the midst of things happening. Yes, our house is burning down. Of course we're not having a peaceful heart. However, if we're selfish about it, um, or we're just, you know, refusing to accept it, or angry about why that happened, angry about the causes of it, then we suffer more. Now we come to the three characteristics, my favorite three characteristics, the three marks of existence, anicca, dukkha, anatta. Anicca, impermanence. Everything changes all the time. Nothing stays the same. We change all the time. We don't stay the same. Dukkha, the basic unsatisfactoriness of things. Nothing will make us <clears throat> completely and permanently happy. And anatta, there's no independent, enduring self in anything, including us. That's the most important thing, including us. We do not have an independent, enduring, unchanging self. And these three aspects apply to everything in our experience, or the things that happen, or the people and things we encounter, all our states of mind and body, all our thoughts, everything, all our experience is has these three marks when we look. So we talk about these three a lot because they're really helpful. If we can bear these things in mind and see them at work in our lives, we can live at peace with ourselves and with others because we're not trying to cling on to things, whether external things or internal things. The three characteristics are all about letting go. Letting go is the secret. We can't keep hold of people. We can't keep hold of things. Because everything changes and passes away. People leave us, you know. And if we try to cling to them, we suffer. If we try to invest our happiness in the other things or people, we suffer because they're basically unsatisfactory. Even the most wonderful relationship, it changes. People die. They leave us. We leave them, you know. And sometimes people have a, a very happy, enduring, long-lasting relationship. It does happen, it does happen. Wonderful. But it doesn't last forever. And we can't 
invest all our happiness in another person because otherwise we'd strangle them. Selfishness, if we think we're the centre of the universe and see everything as being about us, we suffer because we're impermanent too. We don't last forever. We don't have an unchanging, enduring or an abiding self that we can take refuge in. We're impermanent. We don't last. We can't hold on to our idea of our self. And knowing all this is actually a source of peace. We don't have to cling on so hard, try to keep things the same. We don't have to worry quite so much, even in the midst of all the conditions of our lives, the awful things that happen, just to entrust ourselves to the, to the future, to the Buddha. Something takes care of us, even when things outwardly are awful. There's a refuge within. So coming back to our, our world and all the suffering we encounter, how can we find peace with all of that? The wildfires and the pandemic and the racism and the hatred and all the other things, how can we find peace in the midst of this without cutting ourselves off? We don't want to do that. How do we find peace within it, not in spite of it, but within it? Well, by applying the teachings of the Buddha. In fact, there is comfort, as I said, to be found in remembering that everything does change. You can't keep things forever. Nothing lasts forever. Nothing in itself will make us truly happy. Because everything, you know, everything passes, so, you know, the terrible, con you know, this terrible situations people, f people find themselves in will pass eventually. Everything changes. It works to the good as well. And we might wish that the awful things would not happen. We do wish that they would not happen. We wish there would not be wildfires and people losing their homes and the pandemic and all these things. But they do happen. They do happen and we can't prevent that. We can do what we can We can, to do our part. We can't completely prevent it. We cannot prevent suffering. There's a law of karma. It's inexorable. And we don't know all the causes of the things that happen. We don't know what it's like to be another person, or what karma they may be you know, dealing with by the things that happen to them. People make bad mistakes. We can't always prevent that or keep them safe. But often something good comes out of the suffering. It's not just all awful. People learn from their mistakes. They make a terrible mistake, they learn, and the next time, maybe they stay out of something even worse. You know, we just don't know. We can trust them that people will learn. There are wildfires and they need to happen. The forests do need to burn sometimes, whether we like it or not. And then new growth can come up. The trees can be more healthy, you know. It's, pretty un it's cold comfort when your house is burning down to say, oh, well, the forest needs to burn. But it is the case, actually. and we still feel really sorry. The pandemic brought out an enormous amount of generosity and kindness in people, as we know. A willingness to do things in different ways. Willingness to help each other, to learn, to change, to do things differently. We're going to have to do things differently. The Zoom meetings that everybody is having, like everybody else, or well, like many other people, we're having Zoom meetings too. And it means that people who couldn't come here can join in. They couldn't have come anyway, but they can join in our Zoom meeting. So they're really grateful. And we'll keep doing, doing them sometimes, as we said. And all of this has shown us how precious our life is. How precious the people in our lives are in the midst of all that uncertainty. How precious this moment is. It, may never, it will never come again. When somebody's house burns down, they're deeply grateful for what they have for each other, that they're still alive. Even though they may be heartbroken, of course, that their house is gone. It's devastating. And yet, if they're, if they're still alive and they have each other, thank God for that, you know. When yet another black person gets killed by the police who were scared themselves, it's heartbreaking. But it shows us that we need to do something about it. It's been going on for years and years and we 
Now we're, it's in our face. We need to do something. We need to make real changes. Changes in our way of doing things, changes in ourselves and our own attitudes. And it might take a long time, but it will, in the end, help. We will change. I'm sure we will. We better. Anyway. And in the midst of all this, we need to sit still. Not to get so involved with the news that we're completely pulled off our sitting place. The news feeds fear and outrage. It gets everybody all excited about everything that happens. And when you read too much news or see too much news, it can get really kind of involved in, oh, what's happening now, what's happening now? And it's, uh, it's exhausting and it prevents us from sitting still in the midst of it to some extent. Sitting on our sitting place, we need to sit still and offer merit. The merit of our training really does help the world. We need to come nourish our faith in the practice. Sit still and open our heart with compassion for all beings. All of us in this burning house of life, we're all in the burning house. We all have suffering, everybody does in their own way. To sit still and offer compassion, merit, and be grateful for what we have. You know? And we need to remember that all of these things that are happening are not the only reality. There is something beyond it all. There is that which underlies all of it. And we, and everything we are, and everything we do, take place within that, that great compassion. It may not look like it, but it's there. We can come back to that. We can sink into the stillness, the not doing, the silence underneath all that noise and suffering and turmoil. It's not an accident that the Buddha's advice about peace is, is mostly about not doing something, not getting angry not nourishing resentment, not getting anxious and worrying about everything, not clinging so hard to things. It doesn't mean that these feelings don't arise, but we don't need to hold on to them. We don't need to make them our own. My hurt, my worry, my anger, my history, or the things that have happened to me, you know, we don't have to do that. We can let them arise and abide and change and pass away, which they will do eventually if you let them, if you don't cling on to them and make them ours. The sitting still in the midst of all conditions, sitting still in faith underneath all that as best we can, perfectly or imperfectly, just doing our best, just bearing in mind there's a whole lot more than we see. There's a whole lot of things working out that we don't know. But people do learn. Good comes out of suffering, as I said. We learn compassion when there's suffering. If our house is burned down, boy, we can feel sorry for, feel sympathy for somebody else who has the same thing happen. In a way that someone who hasn't had that happen, isn't, it's not quite the same thing. Someone who's been through a war knows what that's like. Someone who's had great pain, sickness, they know what that's like. And they can have compassion for others and learn patience to deal with it. The preciousness of our life, its beauty, its joy, lies in its impermanence. It's not going to last forever. Nothing lasts forever. So, let us do our very best to live this moment as fully and as deeply as we can. Use this opportunity to do our very best, to be still and to be kind and to offer the merit of our training to all beings. The world needs it. We need it. Let us do our best. Thank you. Homage to the Buddha. Homage to the Dharma. Homage to the Sangha.